having me and thanks for sticking around. Um, it's interesting being a speaker at a laser for the first time instead of um, sharing it. So um, I am going to start this talk by introducing and discussing a couple of works of art that I think will help us in defining this somewhat ambiguous term, um, bioart. Um, and I'm going to start with this quite famous piece, uh, Victimless Leather, which was created in 2004 by Orrin Katz and Ian Zur, who are the founders of the Tissue Culture Art Project in Symbiotica in Perth, Australia. And like their other works, like Pig Wings and Disembodied Cuisine, this work is regarded as a paradigmatic work that um, is part of a movement called bioart. Uh, this is an installation in which a small leather jacket is grown in vitro, supported by a biodegradable um, polymer matrix shaped like a miniature coat. Uh, the work is constructed out of laboratory glassware filled with nutrient media, tubes, and a peristolic pump. And in this work, uh, the laboratory is sort of uh, romanticized, which carries the work's aesthetic, um, but at the same time, we sort of realize the absurdity of the installation. Um, you know, a little leather coat. Um, <laughs> and um, so tissue engineering is deployed here uh, in a way scientists have never intended it to be used. Um, to someone without a life sciences degree, this piece may be um, rather mysterious. However, to scientists familiar with these tools and technology um, are likely fascinated by uh, the ingenious setup and um, maybe surprised by the idea of the victimless leather jacket as a possible application of, of tissue engineering. Um, the next piece I want to talk to you about is um, a piece called Nature, um, done by Marta Jimenez in 1998, whose work focuses on the possibilities um, that modern biology offers to artists, um, as DNA and proteins offer an opportunity to explore novel ways of representation and communication. Uh, she showed this piece at Ars Electronica. Um, she engineered a single butterfly wing um, while leaving the other natural, emphasizing the similarities and differences between the unmanipulated and the manipulated, and between the natural and the novel natural. So a growing number of artists um, make use of the possibilities of life sciences to work with new materials. Um, that is, living materials that are not traditionally, um, that don't traditionally belong to the artistic realm. Um, so bioart is distinguished by its medium, which is a living form of matter, um, tissues, bacteria, fungus, entire living organisms, ecosystems, and their life processes. Um, so this could include um, pieces of work uh, that include um, gardening, raising animals, and biotechnologies um, for engineering, uh, tissue culturing, and cloning. These are all bioart processes. And this also implies uh, the use of tools and technologies of the life sciences. So a lot of the bioart literally comes out of the lab. Um, as bioartist Eduardo Katz points out, one must distinguish between artists who simply engage in biotechnology as a topic. So take, for example, a painting of DNA or a sculpture of a chromosome, and those that engage with biotechnology on a materials level um, by actually employing the biotechnology as their very medium. And of course, the materials, tools, and technologies of the life sciences are chock full with all sorts of cultural, political, social, and um, ethical assumptions and implications that are part of this particularly, particular scientific practice. Um, so the use of these technologies and materials within an artistic context automatically means that artists have to deal with these expectations of fears, including their cultural, political, social, and ethical ramifications. Um, and this is precisely what bioartists um, try to tackle. So let us now turn to the um, famous piece made by Eduardo Katz, um, known by some as the father of bioart. Um, Katz took a verse from the book of Genesis in the Bible that reads, let man have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and every living thing that moves upon the earth. Um, he translated it into Morse code and then into nucleotide, nucleotide bases that make up um, our DNA and then grew that into a bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> and so 
the viewers, through the use of a computer, could control how much ultraviolet light the bacteria experiences, or in other words, how much mutation occurred to the DNA, which he then translated it um, back into Morse code and then back into English. And you can see, you know, it's all screwed up with a totally different meaning. Um, and I think this piece, Genesis, is quite uh, quintessential for bio art, especially of the time, um, highlighting this idea of man's dominion over other species and acknowledging the fact that we can and are uh, transgenically manipulating life, and which is a topic that there definitely needs to be uh, more factual discourse on, um, in my opinion. Um, and the fact that we had uh, tools in biotechnology in 1998 for making art was exciting, but the idea of working with biological systems as art is nothing new. Um, arguably, we can say that bio art emerged as early as the 1900s. For example, we can look to Alexander Fleming. Um, and I'm gonna read you a small excerpt from Robert Dunn's story he wrote for the Smithsonian. Um, in addition to working as a scientist and well before his discovery of antibiotics, Fleming painted. He was a member of the Chelsea Arts Club where he created amateurish watercolors. Less known is that he also painted with living organisms. And he produced these paintings by growing microbes with different natural pigments in the places where he wanted the different colors. Um, these were technically difficult to make. Um, I tried it. And um, <laughs> so the story goes, on that fateful penicillium discovering morning, what Fleming actually discovered was, in a way, a version of one of his paintings. So each of the colonies of bacteria he had inoculated on the plate had grown into small shapes resembling a planet or a star in the night sky. But there among his wild planets was something else, a larger, lighter body at the top of the dish, the penicillium fungus. Around it, the sky was dark where the bacteria were dying. In his masterpiece, His Rising Sun, the painting would save more lives than any other discovery. <laughs> Fleming's discovery of the effects of penicillin, um, the compound produced by the fungus, was a function of his eye for the rare, or an artist's eye. I mean, no doubt other scientists before Fleming had seen penicillin in their, in their plates and just thrown them away. But what about the first bioart with intention? Um, perhaps one could argue that bioart really started in 1910. As a joke, three paintings were made by a donkey um, were exhibited in Paris. A paintbrush was tied onto a donkey tail and positioned canvases um, received bright strokes of color. Lolo, the donkey, um, belonged to the proprietor of a cafe uh, where Picasso and his friends got together. <laughs> and news of the prank spread among the avant-garde and inspired the radical wing of the Russian um, Cubo futurist to name their group Donkey Tail, which disbanded a year later, but the idea that non-humans could play a role in art remained. <laughs> but the first real bio-art <laughs> exhibit was at the MoMA, um, by Edward Steichen in 1936. Um, he was a painter and a photographer in addition to a delphinium breeder. And so in June 1936, uh, MoMA presented its first and only dedicated flower show for one week only. Uh, these are plants that Steichen had raised at his farm and then trekked to the museum galleries himself. And if you're interested, it's kind of a cute, um, press release to read. Uh, two years later at the International Surrealist Exposition in Paris, Salvador Dali exhibited an installation piece called The Rainy Taxi, which was made up of a taxi with two mannequins nestled among live ferns with snails crawling around. And there was a mister in the ceiling of the taxi keeping everything nice and wet. Um, to one who argued that that's bio art. Um, so during the Second year, uh, World War, that kind of interrupted the exploration of the use of live materials in art, but seemed to resume again in the 1950s when artists started experimenting with a range of life forms, first in the US and Western Europe, and then in Canada, Russia, Australia, Japan, and China, and I'm sure other places. So um, people started using animals more and more in their artwork, 
Um, this is probably a very familiar piece to you all. Uh, this is a famous performance in which Joseph Boyce shared a part of the Manhattan Gallery uh, with a coyote for one week. Um, today I wonder what the wild coyote was feeling <laughs> sitting in the gallery for a week and how people would feel about that today. It's probably very different. Um, but animals started becoming more and more popular in the use of art. Um, here are some examples. Um, Anna Mendieta decapitated chickens. Um, Mark Pauline tossed pigeons into a shredder. Like, these are all sort of um, shocking uh, performances involving animals. And in a more contemporary setting, the work Alba by Eduardo Katzigan um, comprises the creation of a genetically engineered green fluorescent rabbit which glowed due to the green fluorescent protein that occurs in jellyfish. Um, and part of the art, of course, was the public dialogue that was generated because Alba made, so um, Eduardo Katz couldn't take the, um, the rabbit home with him because he made it, I think, in laboratories in France and you can't take genetically modified material out of a country. And so there is um, a lot of hubbub around that um, which became part of the piece, of course. Another piece he did was Eighth Day, um, which was a piece containing GFP plants, amoeba, and fish, and mice, and a biological robot. Um, as you approach the piece, water sounds, uh, which is supposed to evoke the image of the Earth as seen from space. The biobot has this dividing um, colony of amoeba <clears throat> inside it, serving as the brain cells of the robot. And, um, the biobot can also provide this inside experience for the viewers over the internet. Um, the biobot senses a division uh, in response of the colony, and then it can move about the ecosystem. And so this piece raises the question of transgenic evolution, since all these organis organisms in this piece are mutations of their uh, respective wild type species, and all were selected and bred for GFP mutations. What did I have there? Oh, yeah. And then, of course, I'm not going to talk about this guy too long, but um, he's like the richest artist in the world or something like that. And, um, of course, he's a great example of a contemporary who uses um, animals in his pieces. Um, turning to species a little less sentient now, perhaps we can consider uh, George Dessert, the modern day Edward Steichen, um, who is breeding irises for his work since the 70s. Um, he participated in Paradise Now, picturing the genetic revolution, which was a collection of 39 artists um, who reflected on the attitudes towards genetics, cloning, and the genome project and race. Um, and I want to shamelessly show a few slides of my own bio art, because over the past five years I've been working with fungus grown on potato dextrose auger as sort of a, a new art material. Um, as a sculptural material. Um, I started building, using fungus to build other organism-like creatures, and I've explored the material in terms of what it usually doesn't do, um, like weave, for example. Um, and you can see the close-up um, little colonies of fungus there. And quilting, I had a quilting bee with it where I invited my friends over to come and um, make a quilt with me out of the fungus. Um, people are pretty grossed out by it. People come into my studio and they, like, they ask if I'm like, this is skin from the dead bodies I've killed or something. They're really grossed out by it. Um, I've done, done paintings with the fungus and it's sort of been a collaboration between um, me and the fungus and working with this idea of uh, chance and something that goes from being invisible to um, visible. And, um, and making sculptures with it in, um, with the fruiting bodies now. Um, so bio art is becoming more and more popular in art institutes and universities around the world. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but first, sorry, I forgot about this part. Um, first, I want to talk about um, people who use their own living body for art um, instead of animals or plants. 
Um, so shocking and highly provocative, Orlin uses her body, and especially her face, um, as her canvas. She applies cosmetic surgery to transform her face to a number of forms in which she morphed herself into elements from the famous paintings and sculptures of women. So she uses surgeries to conform her face to the feminine ideal as depicted by male artists, and the surgeries are part of the performance. Um, she shows the power of technology to transform our physical appearance as well, and shows how fungible the human body can be. Um, she's pretty extreme. Um, Australian artist Stellark considers how technology extends the capacities of the human body and how at the same time our bodies are becoming increasingly obsolete. Um, his central claim is that we're transforming ourselves into both cyborgs and zombies, which I see all the time when people are you know, walking along <laughs> like this and looking like zombies, including myself. Um, he's also famous for tissue engineering, a third ear on his arm, and um, famous for his suspension performances, um, which he suspends himself by hooks. Um, <clears throat> this guy, oh, his name got cut off, I'm sorry, Joe Davis. He's been, um, he's my guy right now that I'm into. And um, he's done all kinds of works, um, especially interesting works with Andrew Zaretsky lately. Um, he's another interesting bio artist. Um, Joe Davis is um, at MIT and also the Harvard Medical Laboratory. And um, he does a lot of interesting things. For example, Poetica Vaginal, um, he sent a signal to several nearby star systems um, fashioned from the sound of vaginal contractions of ballerinas. Um, I think he was, a little, he was a little upset by the fact that like NASA um, had not um, included the genitalia of the woman um, when they sent the information up into space. And um, so he wanted those sounds to be sent into space. <laughs> and he's also um, got an apple variety like that's 4,000 years old or something, um, it's closest to what could be, have been in biblical times. Mm -hmm. And he's um, encoding the English Wikipedia into the apple tree genome to make um, a literal tree of life, or a tree of knowledge. Um, but BioWire by no means represents the first in instant in which artists have borrowed techniques and materials from new forms of, of science and technology and in fact, um, historically, artists have often been the first to exploit the capacities of new technologies and the implications of new forms of science. Um, however, for many advocates and bioart critics, the use of bioengineered living beings seems to cross some sort of um, technical or moral threshold. Um, advocates often suggest that bioart creates unprecedented ability, possibilities for art even if it may seem to simply represent a logical next step in contemporary art, which has eagerly embraced new approaches and non-traditional materials such as video and computers in the 1960s and 70s, digital technology and the internet in the 90s. Um, but bioart, using life itself for the purposes of art, um, one can claim to have made a more revolutionary breakthrough in the tradition than the aforementioned technology. On the other hand, this causes criticisms. Can it be dangerous? Can these beings replicate out of control? What exactly counts as art? Um, do the artists and gallery spectators bear some sort of responsibility of living beings or the tissues that make up bio art? And if so, what is our responsibility? And, um, and how do we categorize um, these semi-living beings and what kind of um, steps in taxonomy are we taking to sort of classify these living or semi-living um, new globs of tissues uh, that we're making in the laboratories. Um, I'd also like to point out, because this is kind of, I feel important, uh, a pivotal moment in bioart's history that helped popularize bioart um, while strengthening the notion that artists too should have access to scientific uh, technologies and materials. Um, Stephen Kurtz is a professor of art at Sunny Buffalo and founding member of the Critical Art Ensemble, uh, which um, started in 1987. 
Um, he's known for his work in bioart and electronic disobedience, and because of his arrest by the FBI in 2004, his work often deals with uh, social criticism. Um, so what happened in 2004 was Kurtz's wife, uh, Hope, suffered a heart attack, and paramedics and police arrived at the scene and discovered Petri dishes uh, that he was going to be using in an upcoming critical art ensemble project. And so, believing that Kurtz was a bioterrorist, the police took him into custody. Um, and he had obtained these plates through the mail from a, a geneticist, and um, those two were indicted on charges of mail fraud. And because he was not a member of the ATCC, um, the American Type Culture Collection, um, he didn't have the right to be in possession of these Petri dishes. Um, so there's a lot of talk about this, um, a lot of talk about this trial. And um, so this had significant impacts on relationships between artists and scientists, and, and it brought to question who has the right to work with biological materials. Um, and in terms of bioart and politics, um, I just want, because I just mentioned the critical art ensemble, it's made a large impact, and their focus is on the exploration and intersections between um, art and critical theory and um, technology and political activism. Um, so I was talking about there's a lot of different um, programs happening around the country, um, around the world. Um, I just got done teaching a bioart class at UC Davis last quarter for the art and science fusion program for undergraduates there, where we were um, using bacteria and fungus as media. Um, and then at um, SVA, uh, the School for Visual Arts in New York, uh, they have a bioart program now um, where you can go and do a residency or take some classes. Um, Symbiotica, I mentioned the Ian Atzer and Orrin Katz, they started this program um, in uh, Australia. And um, that's a great program. And they're now offering, now that I finished my PhD, they're offering PhD <laughs> programs in bio art. Um, so for those of you who haven't gone to school yet, you should go do that program. And um, everything's cut off, I see. Um, and also at Texas, um, they have an like a art, science, and technology program. It's not as um, it doesn't really include the life sciences, but it's still um, very interdisciplinary. So um, those are some of the uh, programs that I know of that are happening right now that people can participate in. Anyways, uh, that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions?